Okay, we are back with Eliyahu Berkowitz, writer for Breaking Israel News, author. But right now, I want to ask you about some, some aspects of your story, uh, which you, you, you tell some of your story uh, in your book, uh, in the acknowledgments or... Uh, what do you call it at the end when you, you the, about the about the author? Actually, actually, okay. I think my publisher uh, put the heading "humoring the author." Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. He was humoring me. Um, so I'm not going to cover everything that was there, but one particular point, uh, a couple of points stood out to me. One of them was that uh, although you were raised in a Jewish home, there was a time in your life when you uh, walked. I, I, how do you? How would you say that? I don't know if put it in your own words. Uh, you, I don't were, know how, you were standing outside of Judaism, and, and I, um, tell me a little bit about that. I, well, I don't know. I don't know how I would describe. I, I mean, I took a I took a vacation from myself, and um, what what general age were you, were you in your twenties then? Or well, I dropped out of college um, in my senior year after three and a half years. Um, and I had to make a living. So kind of out of desperation, I went to cooking and I said, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it well. <clears throat> so I, I started working in um, uh, very exclusive French restaurants and eventually um, very quickly ended up in Manhattan and worked there for about 10 years in very exclusive, non-kosher French I was going to say, French cooking. <laughs> no, you can have kosher French cooking, yeah, but, but that wasn't. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that really wasn't. Um, and in very many ways tried to hide from the fact that I was Jewish, the fact that being Jewish was important to me. Uh, it, it, was, it was horrendous work. It was... It was horrendous work to continue to take that position of, of pushing... Aside your well, even your objectively, Jewishness. it was you know eighty. Hours, I was working eighty hours a week. Never took a vacation, um, and I had this ultimate goal in mind of being a chef. And the closer I got to that goal, the more I was doing things that were clearly self-destructive. Um, drinking too much. Um, if I can say I was doing a lot of drugs, I was uh, while I was riding my motorcycle. Um, hanging out in biker bars and just uh, a lot of really, and I wasn't happy. And I said, and um, and I, I think I achieved my ultimate, which was I, I was I was um, I was uh, like a daytime sous chef at uh, one of the, if not the top French restaurant in Manhattan, um, Chanterelle, under Chef David Waltuck. Um, and for the first time in my life ever, I got fired from a job, and I realized it was yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. Um, Working eight hours a week and getting fired. I mean, yeah, um, and I think it was because I was just snapping. I was just, I was at the end. I mean, in a way, he did an enormous, uh, <clears throat> enormous uh, chesed, a really sweet thing for me. Um, but I was unemployed. I had a lot of money in my pocket. And the Grateful Dead were on tour. So I spent, I guess, like two or three months, two months following the dead on their summer tour, um, hanging out with friends, um, giving my brain occasional vacations, um, which might not have been healthy. However, it led me to a place where I said, where I realized that I was going according to the plan, and it was a bad plan. Mm. Mm. It was a plan that was very good for someone else, but it had nothing to do with me. Mm. So at one point I decided that I was going to only do things that I liked, which is very difficult for me to do because I didn't know who I was. <laughs> The, the, most, the most confusing question for me had always been, what do you want? You know, like, that's why I didn't know, I wasn't good at school. I'm like, what do you want? I don't know. What, what do you want to do with your life? I don't know. It's, it's I, for some people, I, I'm amazed when you ask, what do you want to do? And they know. How do you do that? So, <clears throat> as soon as I decided to ask that question deeply, three months later, I bought a ticket to Israel. 
<laughs> it was just, apparently it was clear to me. I just didn't hear the voice. Literally, three months later, um, I went back to work for a friend, someone I liked. And three months later, I walked into the um, kibbutz office in downtown Manhattan. And I said, I'm going to take a vacation. I've never taken a vacation, and I like to work. So I'll take a working vacation. I'll go to kibbutz and do an open. Where is that in Israel? I went to Kibbutz Deliau, okay. and that was through a, in, an incredible misunderstanding. I, I, I went in, they had a notebook with all the, um, with all the uh, descriptions of all the kibbutzim where you could volunteer or have an opan, and I saw organic farming, and a, they have fish farm, and I'm like, wow, it's full of hippies. And um, I had a vision of going to like this hippie commune with, with uh, European women volunteers and it would be a lot of fun. And I show up and it was a German Yeki kibbutz. Um, what is Yeki? Yeki is like the Germans who, um, you know, when they used to set up the tables, they'd line them up in the corners of the tile. Everything oh, had wow. to be... Perfect. And I show up and I'm like, hi, <laughs> you know, I'm a hippie. And they just like look at me. Mm -hmm. I'm a French chef. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a French chef. And they look at me and they're like, their idea of dessert is pickles. Um, it, was, it, was, it was an interesting match. Um, and I did not have any intention of being religious. But I showed up and I think there were two things that really made that stick. Uh, actually, three. Um... One was that in an entirely objective way, the religious lifestyle is preferable. It's very nice. I would go into people's houses. I would see them with their kids. I would see what they spent their time and energy and money doing. And it was nice. I mean, the nicest is Shabbos. You know, I mean... I spent so Friday much nights. You yeah. hadn't had that experience. Oh gosh, you know, and you go. I mean, you go <clears throat> disco. Do, 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 it's all fake. It's all <laughs> it's all glitter in your eyes, meaning nothing. Um, and the religious lifestyle was just. It's objectively speaking, it's nice. It's preferable. I liked it. It felt good. Um, another thing was um, they looked at me and they said, "French chef, you're going to go milk cows." So. <laughs> I spent five years um, milking cows and raising um, baby cows. Um, I actually became, they sent me to courses and I got quite a bit of knowledge about that. But the other thing that certainly influenced me was um, the connection with nature. I remember in Manhattan, you know, you could get strawberries in the winter, you know, you, you could live your whole life and not know yes. what, what, yeah, what season or... Yeah, what it's crazy. You're so disconnected from nature. So disconnected from nature, and nature is such an essential aspect of God, that when you start reconnecting with nature, you start seeing the seasons, feeling the seasons, you start seeing cows giving birth. Um, I remember the cow gave birth, and they have this little half circle. The, ca the calf, when it's born, has a little half circle of something that's like rubber, and it's a different color, and it wears off in like the first three steps. And I looked at that, and I'm like, what is that? And all the guys in the dairy looked at me, and they're like, well, that protects the inside of the mother from the cow's, calf's hooves. And I said, you give me a thousand years to design a calf, I would never think of that. Don't tell me that that is like yes. DNA, amino acids, GNA, yeah. Yeah. DNA, nothing. That, yeah. that is intentional. There yeah. is something behind that. If you ever yeah. see a horse being born, um, they have like this, this um, quick release um, umbilical cord. And as soon as the baby hits the ground, he gets up and he starts running and he's like three quarters legs. Yeah. You see yeah. that and it's like, what are you gonna say? You know, that it's all chance? It doesn't, doesn't work with me. The closer you get to that, and, and that was a big fixing for me. And wow. connecting with people wow. was another enormous fixing. And of course the most enormous influence was um, was uh, the land of Israel. Um, I remember going to En Gedi, and we're with this non-religious uh, tour guide, and she takes us up this plateau, 
And we're standing there, and she's like, yeah, and King David was here, and King Saul was there. I'm like, excuse me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean King David was here? She's like, well, King David and King Saul faced off at En Gedi, and it says in the Tanakh that he was down there, and that King David was in a plateau. And if you look around, this is the only plateau that overlooks there. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> when you say King David, are you talking about, like, you know, I mean, it's like a character in a book. And she's like, Characters in books don't walk around yeah. on yeah. these stones. And she's like, King David, get over it. And I'm like, no, and I couldn't get over it. I'm like, these rocks that are crumbling under my feet, you know, King David walked on. And then the first time you see the Kotel, and I mean, you, you can't go through that stuff. It, it's, in order to go through that stuff and be apathetic, you really have to have a heart stone. And mine do, was, do you remember your first uh, experience at the Western Wall? Or? Oh yeah, I passed out. I well, I went, I didn't all the way pass out, but I was holding on to the fence to not fall over. Wow! It was, and I I walked up to it and said, "Okay, this is the next thing on the agenda," and I nearly passed out. It was just, and I was incredibly merited. Um, my parents had never been to Israel, and I took my father to the hotel for the first time in his life, and he had a very simple reaction. And wow. Yeah, it was very, very significant wow. for me. Wow. Um, it's just, you can't be apathetic. Wow. I've got a couple more questions about your life, but I'm going to weave them into a few questions I have about your book. So in the next segment, we're going to be talking about The Hope Merchant uh, and Eliyahu's new fiction book. And uh, so I look forward to that. So. Hang on, and we'll be back. Uh, don't miss this next segment.